I want us to think about where we've been in complex numbers so far. We've covered a lot of ground and yet at the same time we've also been doing like fairly fundamental things. For example, um, it was difficult enough to like understand, you know, what is I? What's our definition for that? So we introduced it as what? What is, what does it mean? We, yeah, we introduced it sort of as the square root of negative one, right? Um, it's this way of dealing with this weirdo, exotic, strange kind of number, um, but also, importantly, connecting it with the other number system that we're used to. So these imaginary numbers, of course, when you, uh, when you combine them with the real numbers, that's why we get complex numbers, right? So we're familiar with this idea. But then as soon as we opened up this kind of can of worms, right, even some of the simplest things that we've been doing for years and years, actually we noticed in this world, are kind of challenging, right? Um, we could add and we could subtract these numbers fairly straightforwardly, but arithmetic was not dramatically different. But as soon as we got to like multiplication, we started to realize, oh, okay, we have to think carefully about this, right? Um, some of the multiplication ends up being very messy. That's part of why we introduced polar form. For example, if you had uh, two complex numbers, right? Um, here's one. And I'm going to write it in polar form for us. And here's another. And so I'm giving you this all in terms of uh, pronumerals rather than giving you an actual R or actual alpha. Because we can generalize from here, right? If I took these two and I multiply them, this is something we just recently developed, right? What do we do with these things out the front, the moduli? What happens to those? We multiply them, right? So we get R1, R2. And then what happens to the arguments, the angles in here when we multiply these complex numbers? Yeah, we add them. Isn't that convenient? We multiply the moduli, we add the arguments. So we would get, in this case, cos of alpha plus beta, and then plus i sine of alpha plus beta. So you're like, something as simple as just multiplication leads you to complexity like this. Complexity, see what I did there? And then division, right? Just to divide stuff, we had to introduce this idea of conjugates, all that kind of thing, okay? And this is just your basic operations. One of the things we've done, though, is we haven't gone any further than these operations, really. We've, we've done all of these with rectangular form, standard form, uh, Cartesian form. We've also done them with uh, polar or mod arg form. But the, uh, the territory we have not dared to go into yet is the natural sort of extension of this, right? Addition is where we start with counting numbers, and subtraction is just the reverse of that. Multiplication we start thinking about as repeated addition. Like that's what three times five means, right? Like you add up five three times. And we think of division as the reverse of multiplication. Well, just like we think of multiplication as repeated addition, what's that shorthand we use for when you repeat multiplication? What is that? If I said to you like five times five times five, exponents. we would say, yeah, exponents, indices, powers. That's what we would say, right? So um, if we were to write this down to say something like, you know, x to the power of n. Um, the fancy name for this, this is our heading, by the way, is exponentiation. Now, we have not dared to go here because as soon as you start to think about what this means in this world, you run into some massive problems, right? Let's think about this just in the, um, just in the real number world, right? Um, what was the example I gave you? Five times five times five. Okay, so five cubed. We're pretty happy to come up with an idea of what this means on the basis of what we've just done here, right? You're like, oh, I have a definition for that that just uh, sits very comfortably in something you could give to like, oh, I don't know, like a seven-year-old child could understand this idea. You just give them a cube, right? Hence this, right? I could, of course, extend it and do something like that. There'd be no problems. It's just like, just do it more, OK? We can sort of go further in this idea by saying, well, if that's a positive index, what do we mean by a negative index? Like, we'd actually know what this means. What, what, how would you describe 5 to the power of negative 2? Because you're not multiplying anymore, are you? Yeah, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, the reciprocal of the positive index. Okay, the reciprocal of the positive index. So if I had 5 squared, this would be the reciprocal of that. But think about why that must make sense. Like the reciprocal, essentially you're saying, I'm no longer in multiplication land, I'm in division land, right? Well, that makes sense because you're doing the opposite of multiplication. We can even go further and say, sure, you've got natural numbers, you've got integers, we can even handle rational numbers, right? We have a definition for 5 to the power of a half. What is it? How would we normally write it? Square root of 5, right? Because 5 to the power of a half times 5 to the power of a half, just using your index laws, that should be 5 to the power of 
one, because same base, so you add the indices. So you can see how we're kind of extending through, think back to like lesson one in complex numbers, right? These different families of numbers. But then it starts to get real confusing, right? Uh, when we said counting numbers, integers, uh, sorry, natural numbers, integers, rational numbers, I think the next step was irrational numbers, wasn't it? Now, can you come up with an intuitive way to explain what on earth that means? This starts to become trickier, right? You're like, uh, what, what am I going to do with this? Okay. Now we can come up with ways to understand what's going on because, thankfully, uh, these kinds of things here they they sort of go along a smooth curve, right? If I were to graph five to the power of whatever you want, five to the power of x, we know exactly what that curve looks like, right? That's just a stock standard exponential curve. Okay? So just like on the number line, we can just find anywhere on there that we like, we can say, oh, 5 to the 30, that's somewhere over here. Ridiculous massive number. 5 to the power of negative 2, it's somewhere over here. 5 to the power of a half, if I said, if I've got some scale on here, I'd just say, oh, we'll go halfway. Right? And root 2, it's like, oh, that's just another number on here. It's about 1.4. So I don't know what it means exactly, but I can still find a value that makes sense for that, right? And that's what your calculator does, hands you back that value. You can see where this is going though, can't you, right? We're already starting to push the boundaries of our intuition. What on earth would something like that mean? Where does that even go, okay? Now we already know we're going to be pushing the envelopes of our intuition here um, because all of this, everything that you just saw me sort of put up on this graph, it's all real numbers, 100% real. Weird, but real, right? So where does this go? This is the question we're going to try and settle for today. And believe it or not, it's going to settle on some of the stuff that we did in our starters today. So here's what I'd like you to do. Uh, make a little subheading for me. And I'm going to ask you to make this subheading informal proof, which is kind of a... Um, it's kind of a contradicting in terms, but we'll run with it. Okay, what I'm going to try and do for you is develop an idea for what exponentiation indices in imaginary terms are. I want to try and give you a feel for what that is. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of do it in an informal, quick way today. Um, I hope you leave the end of this thinking, okay, that kind of makes sense, but I want to know more. I'm kind of, I would like to get more, like a stronger foundation underneath this. But I think it'll be enough for you to actually start working with the results that we get from this. Okay. So this is going to be the question I sort of want to answer. To get to that, let's have a think about something that I know is going to sound a bit harder, um, but believe it or not, actually gives us tools or gives us access to tools that will be more helpful. Instead of raising a number like 5 to the power of i, you can see how I thought about this actually in terms of um, just functions, right? Once you have a picture like this, all of this kind of falls into place. Does that make sense? Even, even weirdos like this. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put, instead of a number in here, I'm going to put an, an entire exponential function. Okay? Now of all the exponential functions that we know about, strangely enough, the easiest one to deal with is this guy. Okay? Now what's e? Who's encountered this number before? You've seen it before, right? Even if you haven't done heaps of work with it, um, it's a number that's roughly equal to it's about 2.7, 2.71828182A, and it just keeps going, okay? Now, this number has some really important properties which we'll come to in a second. So this is what we're going to deal with. I want to try and understand this, okay? Now, we know complex numbers, right? They have a real part and they have an imaginary part. Real part, imaginary part, that's kind of the foundation we started with. Now, this guy here is not a complex number. It's a complex function, right? It's a whole different kind of object. But it's reasonable to assume that a complex number has a real and imaginary part. A complex function also ought to have a real and imaginary part. Does, does that make sense? There's just going to be two pieces. So how would I write that? The way I'm going to show that is that there will be a, a real part and an imaginary part, like so. But because the thing on this left hand side is a function, these two things here are also going to be Functions. Does that make sense? Like it can change depending on what value of x I put in there. Okay. So rather than writing my um, my bits as a and b, which I should have put this i out the front. Sorry about that. Rather than calling them just a and b numbers, I'm going to call them a of x. That's a function. Do you see that? This is our function notation from earlier in the year. I don't know what this thing is, but it's a thing that changes when I input x. We'll find out what it is in a second. 
Same deal for this guy, right? The imaginary part, I don't know what it is, but it'll also be a function of some description. Are you okay with that? Hmm. This looks like it's getting worse, not better. This is what happens, you know when you've, um, if you ever get to a point, you're like, I should clean up my room. I'm doing some cleaning at the moment, and things always look worse before they get better, right? You're like, things, at least, like they were all in piles, but at least they were in like, you know, together, and then at a certain point, everything's just on the floor everywhere, right? Have you gotten to this point? I hope at least once in your life you have, otherwise you're like, you, maybe your cat's underneath that pile. Anyway, this looks worse than what we started with. You're like, five of the eye looks so nice and neat. But the reason why I chose this is because, like I said, it gives us access to some tools. Here's what I'm gonna do on the next line. Everything here you can see on the left and the right hand side, I'm gonna differentiate it. Everything you can see on the left and on the right, I'm gonna differentiate it. So let's just write what that looks like, right? If I differentiate the left hand side, um, this thing here, uh, index laws, help me out with this, right? Um, when you've got something raised to a power, raised to another power, what do you do with those indices again? Multiply. You multiply them. So I'm just gonna write that like so, is that all right? Like I haven't done anything to it. I've just sort of tidied up this so I don't have more brackets around, okay? Okay, what do I get on the right hand side? Um, this is weird because a of x is some function, b of x is some function. I don't even know what they are. But thankfully I have notation for talking about the derivatives of these even when I don't know what they actually are equal to. If a of x is a function, what would I write its derivative as? A dash is normally the way I would do it. So that's me differentiating that bit. Right? Um, and then I have to kind of do the same thing over here. This is b dash. Do you agree? So I'm just going to write that. b dash. How does that look to you so far? Is that okay? Like so far, I know this looks um, a little bit weird and unusual, but hopefully we can agree it's true. Where can I go with this? All right, I need a bit more space. Uh, I want us to think about a trick that we've been using in complex numbers, which I think we did either in lesson two or lesson three, way back at the start, which is to say, if you've got a left-hand side and a right-hand side, and they both have real bits and imaginary bits, and they're, they're equivalent to each other, right? I should be able to compare the real bits on each side and the imaginary bits on each side. Do you remember that? And they should be equal, right? And we've actually done this several times. We would say equating the real and imaginary parts. That's what we want to do. But at the moment, I'm like, what, what is in here, right? What are the real and imaginary parts in this? Well, we should be able to work it out because unlike over here where I'm like, A and B, who knows what they are? We actually can do some stuff with this because of this function. Now, I know we haven't quite got to it yet, but the reason why I chose e to the power of x is because it has, and I'll just write it over here in a different color. It has this special relationship with differentiation, right? Um, the exponential curve, like this, right? Derivatives tell you about gradient, remember that, right? So you have a look at this exponential curve. Doesn't the gradient of this curve, think about how you would describe it. The gradient of this curve is, is always positive, and the, the bigger your value of x, the steeper the gradient is. Do you agree with that? So the bigger the gradient is. In other words, the gradient of this exponential curve sounds a whole lot like the exponential curve itself, doesn't it? Right? You see this curve is always positive, and the further you go to the right, the bigger it gets. So this curve here, this function, is the special one such that its derivative is exactly equal to itself. Can I say that again? Right? This is the special function whose derivative is exactly itself. And that is immensely useful to try and work out this guy. Let's do it now. I'm differentiating e to the power of not just x, but ix. So think back to your starter questions. I just rubbed it off, but you should have it there in your book, right? What was the first question I gave you? What were you differentiating? x squared plus, x squared plus 1 to the power of 5, right? So which, um, which rule did you use to help you differentiate that? That's a chain rule, right? Because you're like, Pff, I don't have time to raise this to the power of 5 and expand that out, and I don't need to. You had a function of a function. And that's exactly what you have here. Do you see this? You've got a, a function here, e to the power of something, but it's e to the power of another function in there. So I want you to look at how you did your chain rule on question one today. You had two steps, didn't you? You had to differentiate the inside bit, and then you had to differentiate the outside bit. Okay, let's, let's do those two pieces. Here's the inside bit, i, x. We know i is weird, but it's just a number. What's the derivative of i, x? It's just i, right? If you differentiate like 5x, you just get 5. So I'm going to write i. That's, that's it. That's the derivative of the inside bit. Okay? 
Now I have to take care of the outside, right? The outside is e to the power of some stuff, but we've just sort of talked about the fact that this is the weird function that when you differentiate it, you just hand back itself. So if this is the inside, here comes the derivative of the outside. Does that make sense? I know this is kind of weird territory, but you just differentiated this weird, bizarre looking function. That's it. That was us using the chain rule. Are you okay so far?